Let's uh, hit the slides real quick. Softball today at 3 o'clock. Doubleheader. And baseball tomorrow. And uh, Mitch's senior recital tomorrow evening. <laughs> Michaela, where are you? Come on up. Special announcement on this one. Beast of the, of the Beat. Hi guys, so Expose SAU has partnered with SGA and we're putting on an event tomorrow night at 7.30 in the Cougar Den. And it's this group from Detroit of 8th, 9th, and 10th graders who this guy Joe has chosen to disciple and to take out of really broken homes. And he does this through this hip hop rap group. So they're gonna be here tomorrow to perform and I hope you guys can all come and check them out. Their music has been playing like before chapel, so yeah. And the Dollars and Donuts with Professor Lewis tomorrow on, on Friday morning on budgeting, softball Friday afternoon. And then also at the softball game Friday afternoon, there's also uh, the snacks and an opportunity to donate to the Jackson uh, Humane Society. Baseball Friday at 4. And jazz concert Friday night. And the Thrifters Market, get rid of your stuff before you have to pack it up and take it home. Softball at one. And Leah's senior recital on Sunday afternoon. And then all seniors will be in the Ralph Carey Forum Monday evening for their celebration. Chapel a little bit different this morning and uh, leading the presentation of the academic honors will be Mr. Rod Stewart. He's our associate provost and Mr. Stewart is celebrating his 30th year here at Spring Arbor. Rod? Good morning. Glad to be here this morning. We will honor some of you for outstanding achievements. As a community of learners, it is important to recognize those that have achieved academic honors and departmental distinctions. We want to celebrate and accomplish the accomplishment and honor success. We'll begin today with the Department of Biology and Chemistry receiving departmental honors recognition. Will the following students please come forward? Both for biology, Paige E. Albert and Andrea J. Finkbeiner. Receiving both honors in the major and departmental honors in biochemistry, Hannah N. Schrader, chemistry, Jonathan M. Hall, and chemistry, Trevor P. Sims. For other biology and chemistry awards, would the following students please come forward for the chemistry Freshman Award, Leslie L. Tannis. The Organic Chemistry Award, Andrea M. Mullen. The Silver Beaker Award, Leslie L. Tannis. And the MSU Local Section, American Chemical Society Award, Trevor P. Sims. Receiving departmental honors recognition from the Ganey School of Business, will the following students please come forward? For accounting, Cody A. Fellows. Also for accounting, Jenna E. Prill. Also for accounting, Jenna E. Prill. Business Administration, Marcella C. Larsh. Finance, David Owen. Finance, Lauren M. Lyons. For international business, Samantha J. Drowley. Also for international business and for a student currently in China, Stephen P. Murphy, his award is going to be picked up today and by his parents. For marketing, we have two, Brittany M. Huss and Annie M. Norris.
Now receiving the Anacta Student Leadership Award, will the following students come forward? Ken N. Colson, James C. Hart, and Thomas M. Waterway. Let's now give a round of applause for these students from the Department of Biology and Chemistry and the Ganey School of Business. Receiving department honors recognition from the Department of Communication, will the following students please come forward. For advertising and public relations, Amanda L. Hamilton. For digital media, video and film, Jacob N. Fisher. For professional writing, Simon E. Reedsma. For visual communication, David H. Markham. Receiving honors now from the School of Education, will the following students come forward for departmental honors? For early childhood education, Holly N. Dorner. Elementary education, Molly A. Gorsica. Secondary education, Molly K. Anderson. And special education, Michelle L. Hobbs. Receiving recognition for honors in the major, Kaylee M. Anderson. Let's congratulate now those from the Department of Communication and the School of Education. <laughs> Receiving recognition from the English department, would these students please come forward? For English, Dakota M. Holy. For English also, Jordan A. Moore. For both departmental honors in English and honors in the major, Elizabeth L. DeGraff and Caitlin D. Heath. <laughs> Receiving honors now from the Health, Human Performance and Recreation Department, will these students please come forward for both departmental honors and honors in the major. Austin H. Gatza, Alexa, Alexa M. Lauren. Receiving departmental honors in recreation and leisure management, Laura E. Hayes. Receiving honors in the major in health and exercise science, Ashley M. Nelson. Those are our honorees from the Department of English and HHPR. Let's congratulate them. Being recognized now by the History, Geography, and Political Science Department, would the following students please come forward to receive departmental honors. In history, Ethan S. Goodnight. Also in history, Audrey L. Hale, Aaron G. Lunt, Brian K. Weber. And receiving honors in the major, Ethan S. Goodnight and Maria G. Gray. These students have been inducted into the Phi Alpha Theta National History Society. Please stand to be recognized. Robert C. Kessler, Ali L. Herkenroder, Heather N. Lehman. Now for the Department of Math, Computer Science, and Physics. These students are being recognized with departmental honors. Would the following students please come forward? 
for actual, actuarial science, James V. Brinker. For computer science, Ruben W. Rubio. For math secondary education, Molly K. Anderson. For math education, Molly A. Gorsica. Let's now congratulate these students from the Department of History, Geography, and Political Science and the Department of Math, Computer Science, and Physics. Now for the music department, would the following students come forward for departmental honors? Vocal music education, Leah L. Hubbard. For worship arts, Angela G. Angnell. Would these students please come forward for the departmental honors for psychology? We have three in psychology, Lucas W. Barris, Imari A. Peterson, and Sarah Sullins. And receiving honors in the major, Lucas W. Barris and Dakota M. Holy. The following students have been inducted into Sci Chi National Society for Psychology. Please stand to be recognized. Corey E. Good, Lindsey Grubb, Tabitha M. Harden, Taylor R. Johnston, April L. Crott, Aaron M. O'Connor, Lily S. O'Connor, and Cecilia J. Sett. Let's congratulate now our honorees in music and psychology. <laughs> Receiving departmental honors from social work, would Michaela A. Williams please come forward? Would the following students then have been inducted into the Phi Alpha Society for Social Work? Please stand. Hannah N. Ainsworth, Danelda W. Antrup, Kaylee A. Beard, Mallory L. Davis, Natalie M. Fairchild, Yamari A. Peterson, Maggie J. Reynolds, and Michaela A. Williams. From the Sociology Department, would Abigail L. Naraki come forward for honors in the major and departmental honors? And would the following students please come forward as departmental honorees? Criminal Justice, Rachel Spencer. Sociology, Jessica Mabry. The following students have been inducted into the Alpha Kappa Delta National Honor Society for Sociology. Would you please stand? Michelle L. Black, Lindsay A. Burrell, Connor J. Shane, Inna S. Corral, Micah J. Cross, Quinn A. Desenzo, Audria, Audra M. Goodlock, Michael R. Hansen, Tabitha M. Harden, Lily K. Heffenider, Melissa A. Kennel, Brittany L. Lemon, Jessica A. Mabry, Abigail L. Naraki, Danelle H. Rolla, Rebecca J. Snyder, Rachel E. Spencer, Noel C. Tackett. Let's now honor our recipients of awards in the social work and sociology departments. Now will these students please come forward for departmental honors in theology. For philosophy, Brian E. Zinn. For pastoral ministry, Holly A. Holdship.
for Youth Ministry, Danielle D. Burkhardt. Would the following students please come forward for additional awards from the Theology Department? The Greek Award, Brian E. Zinn. The Hebrew Award, Jennifer Stolicker. The Youth Ministry Award, Brooke Piskey. The Department of World Languages recognizes Kaylee M. Weiner for departmental honors. Let's now congratulate her from World Languages and the students from the Department of Theology. I now ask that the following come forward, receiving E.P. Hart honors, Kaylee M. Anderson, Lucas W. Barris, Elizabeth L. DeGraff, Austin H. Gatza, Ethan S. Goodnight, Maria G. Gray, Caitlin D. Heath, Dakota M. Holy, Alexa M. Lauren, Abigail L. Naraki, Ashley M. Nelson, Hannah N. Schrader, and Trevor P. Sims. Let's congratulate these honorees. Congratulations to those recipients. Let's now move to broader based honors with three different categories. First, Alpha Kappa Sigma. It's an honorary society of the free Methodist educational institutions. Membership is based on scholarship, character, and extracurricular involvement, and selection is by the faculty. These seniors must be in the upper one-fourth of the graduating class. Second, Who's Who Among Students in American Universities and Colleges is a national program which honors student leaders for their scholastic and community achievement. Selection for this honor is made by a vote of the seniors and faculty. And finally, students graduating with cum laude, magna cum laude, summa cum laude have accomplished academic excellence at the top of their class and are listed in the back of your program. With the students receiving Alpha Kappa Sigma, Who's Who, and graduation honors as listed in the program, please stand to be recognized. Congratulations to all of you. The following graduating seniors have completed seven semesters at Spring Arbor University and achieved a 4.0 cumulative GPA. They are receiving a certificate and a medal to honor their accomplishments. Would the following students please come forward? Molly K. Anderson. Maria G. Gray. Michelle L. Hobbs. Abigail L. Naraki. Brian E. Zinn. And now a round of applause, please, for all our academic honorees and recipients today. Steve Castle, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations, will now announce the winner, the winner of the 
2015-16 Concept in Action Alumni Award. One of the annual awards granted by the Alumni Association is the Concept in Action Award. This award is presented to a graduating campus senior who embodies the values and goals of the Spring Arbor University concept, demonstrated through academic excellence, leadership qualities, exceptional commitment to serving others, and a life dedicated to the way of Christ. This past month, all students, staff, and faculty had an opportunity to nominate a senior for this award, and many great candidates emerged. The recipient of this year's Concept in Action Award has been an integral part of the Spring Arbor University and greater Jackson community. The recipient has an individualized major in urban development and youth outreach with an emphasis on sociology, urban ministry, and youth ministry, and has maintained a 3.66 GPA. In the words of the staff and faculty who nominated the recipient, he exemplifies the Spring Arbor University concept through his dedication to academics, commitment to the community in Andrews Hall, academic involvement in the creation and development of homeless ministries to serve our neighbors in Jackson, commitment to his church, Jackson Nazarene, investment in the classroom, and an overall kingdom vision and heart surrendered to God. The Spring Arbor University Alumni Association is pleased to grant the 2016 Concept in Action Award to Josh Riddick. Congratulations. Dr. Kimberly Rupert, our provost, will make our next presentation of the morning the McKenna Scholarship. The McKenna Scholarship is made possible through a generous endowment fund established by David and Janet McKenna in honor of his sister, Pat Saradarian, for the purpose of highlighting the concept through encouraging and supporting scholarly con contributions of junior faculty. I am happy to announce the recipient of the award this year is Assistant Professor of Philosophy, Matt Hill. Ty Davis, student body president, will make our final presentation of the morning, the Excellence in Teaching Award. The Teaching Excellence Award is granted each year by the senior class to one member of the Spring Arbor University faculty. That faculty members inspired us all to live the concept in every area of our lives. They do this by modeling what it means to be fully committed to Jesus Christ as one of our examples for learning and living. This year's Teaching Excellence Award winner exemplifies the concept through his passion for the study and application of the liberal arts. He believes in his students and sees their talents. He always challenges uh, his students to expand on their thinking. As their academic advisor and professor, he cares about his students' spiritual growth as much as their academic excellence and career development. Here's an example of what the 2016 thinks about him. He is an exceptional professor, well respected and understood by his students, an awesome mentor, role model, demonstrating his Christian faith and understanding of the world as we know it. He invests so much in his students. He has a great passion in teaching students and a love for Christ. Please join me in congratulating Assistant Prof Professor of Philosophy from the Department of Theology, Dr. Matt Hill, as the Spring Arbor University 2002 <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm pleased to introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. Kim Hayworth. Kim is our Vice President for Student Development and Success. She's a graduate of Spring Arbor, received her MBA from Spring Arbor, recently completed her PhD from Western Michigan University, and is celebrating her 26th year here at Spring Arbor. Let's welcome Kim. Is my mic on? Yes, okay. So I had no idea when Ron asked me to speak this morning, this was back in January when he asked me, that it would be the Academic Honors Chapel. Had I known that, I actually learned that as I walked in this morning, I probably would have prepared a message on maybe quantum physics or something like that. I mean, it's the chapel that faculty are actually attending. So, um, but I prepared my remarks this morning with students in mind. But I do want to take this opportunity, or offer our students opportunity. Many of you probably, unless you've had a really in-depth, intimate conversation with a faculty member, you might not realize how much they really love you and love teaching at Spring Arbor. And so I wonder if you would want to share um, an expression of your gratitude towards our faculty this morning, because I don't think we get this opportunity at commencement or at any other time. So I wonder, students, if you want to express your appreciation to your faculty. Can you stand? Let's have our faculty stand. Okay, so like I said, I did prepare my remarks with students in mind. As Ron said, I've been working at Spring Arbor with college students for 26 years now. And over that time, I've spent a lot of time in my office or walking across campus, drinking Sacred Grounds coffee. And uh, this one topic is a topic that so many students that we've spent time talking about and we're gonna just talk about our thought life. And what I, what I wanna say this morning is all anchored in scripture. And it's an issue that whether you're a student or a faculty member, we all think, right? We all have thoughts going through our minds. So the first scripture I wanna share with you this morning is 1 Corinthians 10, two through six. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then the next scripture I want to share is out of Ephesians 6, 10. I wrote 10 through uh, 20. It's the whole, very familiar passage about putting on the whole armor of God, and I hope that you revisit that. But I just want to pull out a couple of, uh, well, one scripture, and that's verse 12 in this passage. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. <coughs> Spiritual warfare, are you serious? She's going there? Kind of, I am kind of going there. So can you go to the next slide, please? So I did some research on our thought life and how we spend our time thinking. And the average, according to different studies, the average person thinks between 50 and 70,000 thoughts every day. When I read that, it was kind of shocking. I thought it was much lower than that. Now I found one study that said 12, it could be 12,000 to 70,000. I think here at Spring Arbor University, we're at least average, if not above average. So I'm gonna say that we think about 60,000 thoughts every day. 
Now I have this Fitbit up here because um, we're all about measuring our steps, right? If we were to measure the number of thoughts that we have every day, those 60,000 thoughts every day, and if, they, if each thought was one step and then two steps and then three steps, we would, if we averaged, again, 60,000, we would be walking 12 miles every day just in our minds. So think about that how far we're traveling just in our thought life every day. And the other statistic that I, the other two statistics I find really interesting, you can change to the next slide too. So maybe your brain is a bit like this or feels like this at times. The other statistics though that are interesting is that 95% of our thoughts are thoughts are re, are, that are repeated. We've had those thoughts before. And so we're recycling a lot of thinking, a lot of these same thoughts in our minds. And as college students, yeah, that makes sense to you, right? You're studying, so you're, you're reading, you're studying, you're trying to memorize uh, facts and figures and, and things like that. But of our thoughts, of those 60,000 thoughts that we have every day, research tells us that 80% of our thoughts are negative. 80% of our thoughts are negative every day. And so if we could go back to that scripture in 1 Corinthians, it makes sense. Actually, that's, I think it's 2 Corinthians. But it makes sense that Paul describes these, that we are wrestling with these thoughts. It, it makes sense that he uses words like arguments and um, things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Um, this scripture is especially one that's more be an anchor scripture for me because I used to really struggle with my thoughts. And one of, the, one of the times that I was really struggling was early in my marriage. And um, something had happened where uh, my husband and I really, we were hurt by somebody that was close to us. And I didn't really realize how much I thought about this wound until after I realized how much time I was thinking about it. What would happen is that I would sit down every day and put my makeup on before I came to work. So I'd do something like this. <sighs> sit there in front of my mirror. I literally did this, actually I was cross-legged, but I don't want to do that in front of students. But anyway, so I'm in front of my mirror and I'm putting on, you know, my makeup. And it was like I had an appointment with the enemy. And every day I would sit down in my appointment with the enemy, I would review this offense in my mind. And I would see the people that had wounded us. And my thoughts were not good towards them. Talk about negative thoughts. And so I would rehearse the moment that this wound happened, and I would see their faces, and I would, I would play out scenarios about like what it looks like to be wounded, and I, I'm not dismissing wounds, please know that. I'm talking about our thoughts here. But I would sit there in front of the mirror, and I wasn't even looking at my own face, and I was just inches from the mirror. But I would sit there and have conversations with myself, with the enemy, about this offense and what it meant to me and how it affected me and my husband and what, what terrible people would do this. And I just rehearsed it and rehearsed it day after day after day until I ran across the scripture passage and I realized what was going on. I realized that I was in this, this battle with my thoughts. So I'm going to ask you, what are you most conscious of? So just sit here for a moment and think. 
Maybe you haven't thought about what you think about. So just sit here. I'm going to be quiet for just a moment. And I want you to think about maybe what is that repetitive thought or possibly an argument that you have on a regular basis in your mind. You see, because what you're most conscious of is what you'll produce. And so, what are you, what seems to be ruling your thought life? What thoughts seem to maybe be guiding your behavior? What noise maybe is in the background? Maybe when you're driving down the road, driving a familiar direction, and suddenly you're at your destination, and you're like, wait a second, where did the last 15, 20 minutes go? I don't remember turning down Spring Arbor Road. I don't remember turning down Cottage Street. You arrived at your destination and you spent time thinking, what did you think about? Because what you think about, again, is what you produce. And the moment that our awareness and consciousness of those possibly, those negative thoughts, those wounds, become larger and dominate our minds more than the reality of who we are in Christ and that we are children of God, those are the things that we respond to. Those are the things that we act out of. Those are the things we have conversations about. But when we make God more full in our lives and recognize him and his ways and who he is and who we are because of our relationship with him, then we act out of, of, our, of the way we know God and how we know ourselves through him. So if we look at this scripture in Corinthians again, I love the part, yeah, I love the part in uh, verse 2 we'll focus on, who think of us, talking about people, think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And one translation says that as if we walked as mere men. And folks, if there's something that we need to get a hold of in our lives, is that we do not walk around like mere men. Because of the, the claim of Christ on our lives and because of the instructions that he gives us but also tells us who we are in his word, we don't walk around like mere men. Mere men are those that post things on Facebook that make people erupt and make people angry or, and are passive aggressive. Those are mere men. Mere men are those that uh, feel like they have to maybe act violent towards someone else or possibly towards themselves because they don't understand, because they don't have a relationship with the Lord. So we don't walk around like mere men, so that means we don't battle like mere men. So verse 3 tells us, for though we walk in the flesh, yes, we walk around here in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds is a word, you know, we don't use very much, right, in our day-to-day -day conversation. Strongholds means anything that's just out of the will of God or against the will of God. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do you feel like in your mind that you're arguing with yourself? Maybe you're having conversations with yourself, with God. I also saw another statistic that we have over 2,000 conversations with ourselves 
every day. It's normal. And when I read that, I went, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I have conversations with myself all the time. <laughs> So cast, but are they arguments in our minds? So casting down arguments and every high thing that tries to exalt itself. What does exalt mean? It simply means to extol, to promote, to elevate, to advance. So anything that comes, that we receive in our minds, that we entertain in our minds, that exalts itself or promotes itself against the knowledge of God. But what happens when we don't even recognize what is exalting itself against the knowledge of God because we don't know the knowledge of God? That's part of our issue, is our relationship with the word. And you've, I mean, this is probably your 24th chapel of the semester. And so you've heard, you've heard some messages that are anchored in the word. But if that's all you're relying on, then those 60,000 thoughts that you're having every day are not probably dominated by what God says about you and the relationship that he wants to have with you. Sometimes I think that we think that God, that we serve a God that's maybe sleepy, he's tired, he's busy. He's been around a long time, so he's, you know, he's old, right? He's not active. But those are thoughts that are not anchored in the word of God. Because the word of God tells us that he's here. He's with you wherever you go. He's active. He's involved. But if we don't know that, if we don't have that knowledge of God, our perspective is skewed. Maybe we make him look very human. He's like so-and-so, or, you know, he'd look a lot like Ron Capico, or act a lot like Ron Capico, or something like that. But that would be a mistake. As great as Ron is, wow. The Word of God defines God in amazing ways. And if we're not familiar with it, then we're caught in them, our own thoughts and our own makeup of who we make God to be. So what does the enemy promote in your life? Ask yourself, do you fight carnally? Carnal's kind of a funny word too. We don't use that every day, right? So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You know, for a while in the church, there was this thing where we were fighting maybe different habits, that poor habits that we had or poor thoughts that we had and we'd wear these rubber bands and any time that thought came across our mind, we'd tunk ourselves, you know, like, like, oh. like that little bit of pain was supposed to correct or remind us. And I'm not downplaying that, but to me, that's a very, that's a, that's a very human thing to do when we have what we need, the weapon we have is right here and so available to us. So the other thing I wanted to point out is just what it looks like to bring every thought captive. Again, 60,000 thoughts a day. I'm not saying that it's possible to capture every thought, but in Romans, it tells us that we can transform our mind. Romans 12, I want to focus on verse 2 here. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm sure that when those seniors, so that were honored today, I'm sure that when they came to college, uh, let's say you're a chemistry major or Brian with Greek, you know, they didn't walk in the door and think like a chemist or perhaps think like a theologian. But now your senior year, you've spent a lot of time, you've read hundreds of pages, you've done hundreds of assignments, written a lot of papers, hopefully. Um, and so your mind now has been transformed. Whether you realize, realize it or not, 
You're a theologian now. You're a chemist now. You're an educator now. You think as an educator. You think as a chemist. I'm sure that you see things that the rest of us see in much different ways because you have transformed your mind. And the Word of God can, can, can transform your mind as well. So those areas before that I asked you to just pause and think about, what are, those, what are those areas in your mind that seem to be those conversations, those arguments, those thoughts that you have over and over and over again and they're tailored right to you? Nobody has those same thoughts. Scripture tells us that. Where do you need to be transformed? And where do you turn when you want to transform your mind? Well, you turn to scripture is what you do. And I've just chosen a few scriptures that over time, or topics over time with students that have just come up as we've talked. And so perhaps you have issues... Um, you're trying to fight against maybe poor self-esteem. Or you have thoughts of you feel alone. Well, God says you're never alone. According to Psalm 39, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. If you're batting, battling with self-esteem, and if you're allowing the world to define your self-esteem, you will always come up short. Miss Universe will come up short if we compare ourselves to the world. But if we compare ourselves to the Word of God, what does Acts 10.34 says? Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. So maybe you, you have poor self-esteem because you're comparing. Well, he'll do that for that person, but he won't do that for me. I'm different. He's not the same. He treats that person differently. They're special. It's not true. So this is a way to fight that argument in your mind. Turn to Acts 10, 34. Again, never alone. I love this passage. You have searched me and you've known me. You know my sitting down and you know my rising up. Okay, sometimes that's a little scary. He knows that. He's aware. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. How precious are your thoughts towards me, greater than the sands of the sea. When I read that scripture, when I read that chapter, which I pray that you would read that chapter even today, man, that makes me sit up a little straighter. I put my shoulders back a little bit further because... God's thoughts are precious towards me, towards you, greater than the sands of the sea. You're never alone. What about forgiving yourself? Maybe you feel like, I've done something and I cannot forgive myself. Well, Scripture says in Psalms 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgressions from you from us. And so when those thoughts come and your mind is transformed to I can't forgive myself, you need to combat that, like 1 Corinthians says, you need to combat that with the word of God. And that's how we wrestle. That's how we can transform our mind is using scripture. I've heard somebody describe it as you're like repainting a canva the canvas of your mind. The canvas of your mind is painted a certain way, like I can't forgive myself. I constantly re remind myself of this grievous sin that I have in my life. And scripture says, man, when you've asked for forgiveness, it's gone. He doesn't remember it anymore. And so when that thought comes in, this is what you can do with it, is that you can, that thought comes in and you replace it. You don't just recognize it, but you replace it with the word of God. And soon that transformation will come. When that thought comes in about not being able to forgive yourself, your thoughts will go directly to that psalm that says, no, as far as the east is from the west, God has removed my transgressions from me. 
What about forgiving others? Maybe you can forgive yourself, but you can't forgive others. And so you're like me, sitting on the floor, putting my makeup on every day. I could not forgive these people. I didn't have the right not to forgive those people. Because Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says, Therefore, as the elect of God put on tender mercies, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must forgive. I had no right to withhold forgiveness. Next slide. So what about trusting in the Lord? We know this scripture is a favorite, especially this time of year with graduating seniors. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So when that thought comes in, I don't know what the future holds. You're right. You don't know what the future holds. But you have this, you have his word about he'll be with you your paths will be straight. If you trust and lean, that's part of it too. We have our own responsibility. And then the last scripture that I'll lead with you, this is worried about the future, and this is something I think a lot of college students struggle with. This is out of the Message Bible. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of them which are never seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with the getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People don't know God and the way he works. They fuss over these things, but you know God and how he works. Steep yourself your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to God, to what God is doing right now, and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. You see, people in the world are looking for people that don't walk around as mere men. And we as believers, we should not be walking around as mere men. And I truly believe that when the church gets a hold of this and really lives it out, we won't have to stand on the street corner and try to evangelize. Because the world will be drawn to us. That scripture that says they will, they will know us by our love. It's because we will be living it out. Because we're so connected with the word of God and we know who we are that our minds are transformed and we live out of that reality instead of our woundedness or whatever we see going on in the world around us. So I hope that this has helped you realize that it's time to capture those thoughts. And even sometimes when I talk with students, I say, you know, it may look silly. You may think of it silly, but capture that thought. Do, even if you need to do a motion. And what it means is capture it and bring it to submission. And so you've got to capture whatever that thought is. And then what does the word of God say about whatever that area is? Scripture tells us that everything that pertains to life and godliness is found in the word. So you can find that replacement that will transform whatever that thought is in the word of God. Thanks for your time this morning. Have a great day and the rest of the semester.